Welcome to Establish the Edge. I am a very flustered Mike Leone, uh, getting ready for the AFC North version of the Offseason Projections Podcast Special with Ben Gretsch. Uh, ben, we've had you know we've had a, a little bit of a hectic time scheduling this. I got locked out of my house, and we've had some reschedules, but here we are, ready to break down the AFC North. This is the third episode in this offseason projection series so make sure you check out the afc and nfc east for episodes one and two as always you can find ben at bengretch.substack.com and also at yards per gretch on twitter you can find me at two hats one mic on twitter and all my work over at establish the run ben how's it going it's going great man i'm excited that we're we're finally here to talk yesterday you had some uh, appliance guys show up a little earlier than expected. Oh You've had a, it an just, eventful it couple just days. A week, you know, I got people <laughs> coming to fix stuff. I got my son's done with school, but my wife, who's a teacher, is not done with school. And it's, it's, you know, things, things are scheduled tightly right now for this. For week. sure. Yeah. But yeah, AFC North, this is fun. I already see where we have, you know, some bigger discrepancies than we had in, in some of, you know, the first two podcasts, we'll start with the play calling for Baltimore, which is interesting with the offensive coordinator switch going from Greg Roman to Monken for Baltimore. I've a lot of guesswork here. We're a little bit more aggressive on Baltimore have 64 and a half plays per game to Ben 63 and a half plays per game. Also have a 60% called pass rate. Uh, Ben's more like 58%, which you know, it is some meaningful differences when you back into pass attempts or almost two pass attempts per game higher. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a really interesting um, talking point for sure. I, I, I'm shifting them towards, you know, a bit faster, towards a bit more early down passing with the addition of Todd Monken. Uh, Pat Thorman had some had a great write up about that over at ETR. Definitely recommend reading his all of his pace notes. Um but last year, their pass rate was about 54%. The year prior, they were up at 63%, but they were higher in the games Lamar missed. And that was that year where they had a lot of crazy games. They basically were like the Vikings in 2022, were like a lot of crazy game scripts, forced a lot of late passing. They still had a very slightly negative, basically neutral, but very slightly negative pass rate over expected. One of the things I do in my projections, I look at Vegas win total and have like a really rudimentary win total expected pass rate. And so... In 2023, with their Vegas win total, I have them expected to pass in 2023 uh, just above 59%. So you guys would have them slightly positive in PROE, which I think is definitely possible. I kept them still slightly negative, but still a lot closer to neutral like 2021, not like last year where they were you know, about five percentage points to the negative in PROE. Go back to 2022 and earlier, they were even greater to the negative in PROE. So I have them about... Minus one and a half PROE. It looks like, you know, based on my expected pass right here, you guys have about a half a point positive PROE. I think that's the range that we're thinking about, right? In terms of how much pass heavier they'll be. Mm -hmm. But I, I like, you know, see, I, I, I'm excited to look through your guys' projections here at this number to see even a little bit more aggressive than the, the stance I took. Yeah. And I mean, it's difficult. I think some of the hard part with these situations, like I think of the Eagles a year ago where it's like, oh man, this offense could make a big leap. They could be really efficient, but like, I'm having a hard time, you know, the market's taking that into account a little bit. And it's like, you know, it's kind of hard on pure projections to get these guys. So we did ramp up the aggression. I did make one of my um, heaviest long shot futures bets that I've, that I've ever made with Lamar Jackson Took him at 100 to one on DraftKings to lead the NFL in passing touchdowns for the year. I think it's down to 75 to one now, but um, I think that's like bets like that are kind of a good way to, to capture the range of outcomes. So like not necessarily on his regular prop over, but taking advantage of the volatility there. It's also hard. I, love like, that. I think he's already Ari, done it. He's, he's already, already led the league in pass touchdowns. 100 to one. Yeah, he's done it. Um, so I think that's like his passing yardage was like 40 to one. And it's like way more likely he leads the league in passing touchdowns than passing yardage. Um, right. So I thought, you know, that there, that was off, but I digress looking at the efficiency. We might've also dialed back his efficiency a little bit too much. Cause even with the added pass attempts, we're about the same in terms of yards. You actually have them a little bit higher in pass touchdowns. So um, I think we might've, you know, over regressed that and, you know, just some 
maybe leaning on some of the the struggles last year a little bit too much. Uh, so you've got a more optimistic total projection on him, despite us being heavier pass, because that pass efficiency kind of cancels out the volume. And then you've got him running a little bit more at over a thousand rush yards. We're at 896. And some of that's just hard to parse out. Like we're assuming he's going to lose some designed rushes this year, but also if his scramble rate holds steady and they're dropping back more frequently, he's going to scramble more and it's going to offset to an extent. So still seems to me like, like he could easily be the QB one overall. I wouldn't be shocked. Um, I think his ADP is about right as the QD QB four, but a little bit easier to build around him. If you can get him, especially like more towards like mid three, three, four turn versus sometimes Mahomes, Allen hurts are all off the board in the second round. Yeah, I definitely like him. When we talk about his rushing, I'm pretty bullish on his efficiency. But if you break out, you mentioned that gap between scrambling and design running. If he does have more scrambles this year, basically every quarterback universally is going to have a higher yards per carry on scrambles than design runs, often two to one. And that's because some of the design runs are like kneels and, and QB sneaks and stuff, but also just because scrambles, you're in more space often. Lamar's really interesting trait is that his designed yards per carry is also really efficient. You can look at even like the, but basically every other mobile quarterback on design runs, you're, you're usually talking about like a, what looks like a normal yards per carry, like a running back. It's in the like three, sometimes it's down at like three or 3.5. The good ones are at like 4.5. Lamar in like three, the last five years or four years has been at 5.7 or higher. Last year, he was at 6.5 on just design carries. He's like an elite running back when he gets design runs. Um, and so that's another reason I pushed up his rushing efficiency. Like for me, it's like, don't get it twisted. He's still the best running quarterback in the NFL. He's better than Justin Fields, who had the most rushing yards last year as a runner. He's better than, um, you know, any other quarterback in the league that you can even compare him to. He's just so fluid and, and so good or what have you. So yeah, I'm a, definitely aggressive with, a, you know, projecting a thousand yard rushing season, but, um, and then, and then I am a little aggressive on his passing efficiency as well, but a little bit banged up the last couple of years. You go back to 2019, 2020, uh, very efficient those two years. My, my efficiency is closer to that. Part of that's because he's got better weapons now, right? He's got a yeah. deeper receiving core than ever before. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because that also, you know, you not only have the coordinator change with Monken, but you also have the team signaling a little bit what they're going to do with bringing in Odell Beckham, drafting Zay Flowers, hopefully getting a healthy Rashad Bateman back and, you know, a healthy Mark Andrews and, and things change quite a bit as far as what's at Lamar's disposal. Even when he led the league in passing touchdowns, like, dude, he was thrown to some randos that year. Um, yep. They were just clicking on all cylinders. Looking at the ground game at running back, you've got a wider split between J.K. Dobbins and Gus Edwards than us. Again, I think this is a spot where there's some uncertainty with, with the new coordinator and also Dobbins hopefully being a bit healthier uh, it seemed like he was finally getting back to health towards the end of last season, had a, you know, a pretty tough knee injury that he was coming back from, but you've got 227 carries for Dobbins, 73 for Edwards. We've got 169 for Dobbins, 137 for Edwards. So kind of leaning more on what they've done historically versus assuming Dobbins takes over. Probably if I had to handicap it, I'd put it put the split somewhere in between what we have. Yeah. I think, I think I'm too aggressive here for sure. But I, my note was there's a big difference between a 24 year old Dobbins who turns 25 in December coming back from injury and, and potentially getting to a high level and a 28 year old Gus. And I have some qualms. He'll return to Gus will return to his old self. He has fewer than a hundred touches over the past two seasons combined. His best days are 2020 and earlier. Also only 18 career receptions versus 501 career rushes. And that always, in my opinion, made him a tough bet anyway, where, you know, as a late round running back, where like all the upside is just rushing efficiency and production. And now we, you know, we're looking at a 28 year old coming back from injury hasn't really produced over the last couple of years. I think there's a lot of risk there. I know there's some people that really like Edwards late. He's not a, a back that I'm super in on. And then as a result, my projection lines up probably too optimistic on Dobbins from a workload perspective. Yeah, I know we're slightly ahead ADP on Dobbins. Um, so I'm guessing, you know, he's close to a target for you. We do, I should note, you know, in our upside case, we have, you know, obviously a much bigger gap between Gobbins and Gus where like Gus is like the upside case isn't like that much different than his base case. Right. Like it's like, right. you know, Dobbins gets hurt and he gets a few more carries, but it's still split with someone. Whereas Dobbins upside case is more like, you know, this, this is kind of like a work 
I don't know, workhorse, but like you obviously lose a lot of carries to Lamar in terms of carry share. So I think our upside case is like 60% carries, but in terms of running back carries, that's like a really high percentage if you compare it to, to other running backs. So yeah, Dobbins looks like a solid guy to take if, you know, kind of just depends what you're doing structurally. Um, I'm a little bit more into Gus late round. Like he's not someone that I'm trying to get every draft, but just think that you start, you know, he's going late enough that I think you can get some usable weeks out of him. He's probably a better best ball bet where it's like he can find the end zone and get there on rushing efficiency on some weeks, not a huge ceiling. Uh, in redraft, sometimes you're looking more for like, well, I'd rather take a much lower probability hit, but if it hits, it should, sure. you know, be there in a, in a meaningful way. So th- there's a little bit of difference in format there on, on Gus. Definitely. Uh, I don't think we need to talk about Justice Hill. We both have him as the third back with like 30 carries. So um, let's go to wide receiver. Which I mean, is- this the note I would make there is just this seems like a low key spot that could still add another running back too, and that I think would mm-hmm. would probably sink Gus pretty bad. But Justice Hill back as a number. I was looking through their depth chart. I was like, man, they do not have a lot of running back depth. Yeah. Wide receiver, another situation that's a little bit tough. It's not quite Giants esque where the Giants have like eight guys, but it's tough to kind of parse the pecking order between Bateman, Flowers, and Odell. I think, you know, for me, I've got Bateman at 90 targets, Zay at 82, Odell at 74, scaling it that way. Some assumption there that Bateman is healthy. I know there's some concerns out there that like, you know, that Liz Frank injury can can linger a bit. And I, I mean, I think Odell for me is like a pretty clear third just – If you look at the age, you look at the investment in Bateman and Flowers, just kind of deferring to the youth there. I think Odell could be like fine in a real football perspective, but I don't necessarily think that's going to equate to a ton of volume, though. You have him right now slightly ahead of Zay in targets with 85 for Odell, 81 for Zay, 95 for Bateman. And this has been tough for me to get these receivers in an offense I kind of want to invest in because I think it's got a ceiling that people don't realize, but... Uh, you know, the ADP seem a little bit rich on the, the receivers given, you know, it's it's a little bit crowded. And you've also, you know, we'll talk about Andrews at tight end, but he's going to be the target leader on the team. Yeah, that's a great point, I think. And this is one where I think you only invest in these receivers if you think they can kind of differentiate. Bateman, I think, has the best shot to do that. I am a little bit aggressive on Beckham, looking back at some of his old targets by run rates. I mean, I was just making the case about Gus being two years removed from good production but Beckham was still pretty solid as recently as 2020, mm-hmm. um, 2021 tough sample and wasn't always necessarily healthy. Obviously misses all of last year, the Twitter doctors and the people that I've heard from think that he can physically get back. The second ACL is no different than the first. It's not like his knees, like never going to be great again. He can rehab and be good and, and taking all of last year off, I think makes it interesting. My note on Zay is I think he's a, like your traditional late season rookie bloomer. So I actually am still taking him at a more expensive price than Beckham, even though I have the smaller target projection here on the whole season. I do think they signed Beckham, you know, you talked about the commitment to Zay and Bateman, but obviously to a pretty substantial free agent contract for Beckham. I do think they're going to start the year assuming Bateman's healthy, because you mentioned that too. That's a confusing element. It's really tough to dial in these target shares. But yeah. assuming Bateman's healthy, I think you're going to see a lot of Bateman and Beckham early. And Zay playing, but sort of working in in the three wide receiver sets more so than the two wide receiver sets, right? And kind of building. And then if he hits, he's hitting in a late season kind of way. We see that with a lot of rookie receivers. He seems like one uh, that fits that bill this season. But yeah, I mean, like, OBJ could just be a complete shadow of his old self. I'm 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 projecting this somewhat aggressively on him. I just think it, it'll be tough for Flowers to completely um, out earn Beckham, especially early in the season when Beckham had the big free agent contract. Yeah, that's definitely fair, and it does seem like Bateman Flowers' ADPs have become more reasonable the last couple of weeks. So we're taking them, and you know we mentioned. You know, best ball, obviously, you're kind of correlating like based on what you do early in your drafts. But I think with Lamar specifically, if you take Lamar, I think you can make some assumptions with the receivers that like this is going to go pretty well. And that correlation to me might shift more significantly than like a different correlation early on um, in terms of what you're assuming. 
goes right. I don't know if that makes sense, but just it might just because there's a wide range of outcomes and for you're sure, taking Lamar, you're kind of assuming the pass heavy thing goes goes well. Um, and and uh, I, I want to say one more thing on Bateman because I I kind of skipped him, but his A dot as a rookie was nine point six and went to thirteen point two last year. He didn't run a ton of routes; was pretty banged up. Uh, his catch rate fell, but his yards per target like shot up. So he was actually like a pretty good deep threat in a very small sample last year. His targets per out run much stronger last year. Yards per out run jumped to 2.38. Really good number. Again, very small sample, only 120 routes. But that was really nice to see after his, you know, per route numbers weren't strong as a rookie necessarily. Is banged up again, as you mentioned. But I love seeing that he was able to produce at in basically in sort of different roles at different depths. He's looking like a guy that is kind of coming into the league with had a really strong production profile in college, looking like a guy who can win at all depths and potentially in all ways. And um, yeah, I mean, 120 routes again, but it's what you wanted to see in year two to, to argue that he could potentially have a year three leap. And, you know, I'm, I'm actually like the giants. It's tough to parse the pecking order. Unlike the giants though, you don't have like the crazy death top to bottom. So we've each got Devin Duvernay for like 20 ish targets at wide receiver four. So this could be while there's Bateman flowers, Beckham and Andrews, it could be, it sounds ridiculous, but like it could be concentrated where there's just not a lot of random, like fifth wide receiver targets. Like some of these teams just mix those in. We don't know, um, but that would be a good sign for those receivers being able to be productive despite, you know, all of three of them getting playing sure. time. The, the depth piece that's most likely to like kind of actually see targets is probably the tight end too and Isaiah Likely. So shifting over to tight end, we've got 127 targets for Andrews. You've got 123, slightly notable because usually we're more conservative on the high end than, than Gretsch. But we both have them like around 1,000 yards, seven receiving touchdowns. has also shown the efficiency, I think, to flash in, in TDs in a big way. Uh, I like Andrews a lot. Our ranks kind of have him as like, fair value on underdog. I think we're ahead of his ADP a decent bit on FFPC though, for tight end premium. I still think, I mean, I've been betting on Andrews basically every year, but I still think like what we saw at the beginning of the season last year, you know, he, he seemed like he was a league winner and then things just went kind of South for his health and for Baltimore in general. So I'm still in on Andrews, but likely is, is super interesting as a really late round tight end as someone that has, we talk about contingent value at running back a ton. We don't talk about it at tight end a lot, but likely probably has the most contingent value of any of the backup tight ends. Yeah. I think that's like kind of indisputable, right? Because he looks, he had a good production profile. He looked really good in year one. He looks like a guy who can be successful and, and almost very clearly would see his routes jump. If Andrews were to miss time, and we know this is an offense that's going to use the tight ends, although it is a different offense. And so, yeah, I mean, I'm lower on, Andrews targets and a little bit lower on likelies. I didn't really know what to do with the tight end rate target rate as a team last year. It was over 40% and it was actually higher than the wide receivers were targeted, which is absurd. Usually wide receivers are at, at least two times as, as heavy in terms of the total number of volumes uh, of volume to the position. Um, I have the tight ends this year at about 32% wide receivers jumping up to 55% because they've added more wide receiver depth. And so I'm, I'm pulling that from, you know, maybe some of these two tight end sets, maybe likely he's not actually playing as much. I didn't really know how to how to parse that, to be completely honest. This is like a tough uh, element here as well. When we were talking through the receivers, like how much does likely actually play? He had a role yeah. last year in, in some of those two tight end sets. But I, I feel like this, I agree with you on the kind of the um, contingent value, the standalone value might not be great in a new offense. Yeah, that's a good point. Cause I mean, when you are drafting tight end late, it's like, well, likely has the biggest upside, but you kind of want some semblance of standalone value. And it could break a couple of different ways. If those tight end targets are reduced as a group, that could completely squash likely standalone value. Or it could be like if Andrews runs a little bit lower route share, then that's and likely stays up. That's not great for Andrews. I don't think it would like totally impact the way I'm thinking about him, but few different ways it can break. So for me, for likely drafting him kind of comes down to like my team construction. I'm generally not taking him where I'm relying on that standalone value. I'm taking him in like, you know, if, like three tight end builds or even a, four I tight guess, end builds. Four, or, yeah, four tight, four <laughs> tight end. He's the perfect. I mean, we took yeah. on four tight end builds, but he's perfect for four tight end builds where it's like 
you play roulette with the other three being okay. And then like, you've got the free roll on the, the likely upside, but even single elite tight end builds as the tight end too, you know, he can work where like, you know, you're basically banking on Kelsey, but like, if you happen to get like this huge season from likely, it could be an interesting combination. So I don't have a ton of likely, but I draft him like a little bit ahead of our ranks, just depending on my, my team construction uh, thoughts on Andrews. We talked about likely a decent bit, but just Andrews overall is a, a third round pick in non tight end premium. Yeah, I like him. And I think the comments you made about picking Lamar apply even more to Andrews at his cost. We're like, I like stacking those two when possible. It's a little tough with ADPs, but if you're betting on Lamar, you're probably betting on Andrews being very much worth that price tag. Um, the, I don't I don't think likely is going to cut in too much. I guess my concern is more that they just run more three receiver sets, but I think Andrews is ingrained enough that he would most likely get all the routes regardless, right? It's just like, will they run some two tight end sets for likely, but I don't I don't have a much concern about Andrews playing a ton. It just is, uh, you know, how much does the pass rate increase? How much? I think the receivers can help him as well too. Just the having the depth of options downfield. So anyway, yeah, no, I know I I like Andrews. I'm back in on him. Um, I'll probably bump my my projection a little bit as you mentioned. I'm light on on him relative to you guys, which usually means I'm extra light because I'm usually coming in a yeah. little hot. Uh, speaking of coming in hot, let's move to Cincinnati where we can talk about Gretchen's Joe Mixon projection that I'm sure he hates. Uh, but before we get into Joe Mixon, <laughs> we'll do the, the play calling for Cincinnati. We both have them above average amount of plays, kind of like 64 and a half to 65, right around 64% called pass rate. You know, there was definitely some encouraging stuff for Cincinnati last year with Burrow fully healthy in terms of just relying on what they do best. So We've each got Burrow for around 365 fantasy points in, in your traditional four point per passing touchdown scoring, almost 5,000 yards throwing, like 34 passing touchdowns. It's hard to be super fantasy viable relying just on, on throwing the football, but Burrow can do it given the immense skill wide receivers that he has at his disposal in the way that they're calling plays. Yeah, I mean, I think we had some concern about whether Zach Taylor was sort of a fake sharp or whatever when we talked about this last year. I think we what we saw last year was this is a team that, and even with their conversations about what they're going to do with Mixon this offseason, this is a team that understands where their bread's buttered. They understand how to keep pace with the best teams in the AFC to be able to beat Kansas City and beat the Bills in the playoffs. They're going to need to be a pass-first offense. I'm pretty confident that they've learned that lesson. They understand that. That's how they're going to play. They need to get the ball in Burrow's hands and then ultimately in Chase and Higgins hands. Um, one of the cool things when you go through the projection, Burrow's completion percentage really high. All the ancillary pieces are efficient. You get to like Trenton Irwin and he's like super efficient in this offense. The running backs all have like 80% plus catch rates over multiple years. Uh, when you look at, I mean, when you look at like Mixon over multiple seasons, you look over, look at P Ryan over multiple seasons. I don't think he was over 80% last year, but over like the last three combined, he has been, that's like um, just a positive, marker on burrow right and we know he looks good on like completion percentage over expected and a lot of those stats but when i see guys like trent Irwin, who i don't think are probably elevating their efficiency themselves having like nine yards per target it seems like every dude in the offense that's just an ancillary piece is doing that it, it helps to have good qb play and it, you know it's a reminder of like how these guys can be good tack ons in, in best ball stacks and those kinds of things yeah not so burrow necessarily but <laughs> We're all going like more towards that four or five turn now as we've seen the QB prices kind of adjust, become a bit more normalized where they're more aggressive than last season, but not as aggressive as they were early this draft season. And, you know, in best ball, you, I think you like have to stack him with one to chase or T. Like it's hard for me to take him unless it's a really good value after that. Uh, in your managed leagues, like you, you can get away with not necessarily having that elite correlation. But uh, yeah, he seems valued appropriately uh looking at running back the mixing situation is tough because there's still like what's the suspension risk and also if you look at last year the workload was great through the course of the season but then you get to the playoffs and they clearly favored p ryan over mixon uh depending on the game you know when they were grinding it out against buffalo and had the lead it was a lot of mixing but when they they were using P Ryan from the get go in the game against Cincinnati or a game against Kansas city. It wasn't like a game script. They, they clearly wanted to use P Ryan in that game. Now you lose P Ryan. Don't add anybody else. And it's like a tough situation, Ben, because on one hand, you still have those concerns with Mixon, but on the other hand, like if they enter the season with this running back group and he's not suspended, 
like it looks pretty good for him. Even in a two down role, he was getting to like a 10 percentage target share. So uh, he, he's been a tough one. I love taking him early when people are way scared and he was like six to eighth round pick. He's moved up though. Um, he's now, you know, pretty firmly like a fifth round pick, even like early five. Yeah. This is another one where I didn't know what's going to happen here. I, I thought it was really hard to parse. I, Chase Brown's a, a, an interesting prospect, but a day three back, they haven't really liked Travion Williams enough to use him a ton. They haven't really liked uh, Chris Evans enough to use him a ton. P Ryan was the guy they seem to trust and he's obviously gone. Um, what I wrote in my notes was, I don't know what's going to happen in this RB room before week one, but it's staying untouched feels least likely. I mean, we have the conversations about Mixon going to potentially still be asked for a pay cut and we'll see what happens there. They want to get the Burrow deal done later this summer. And so it's, you know, it's kind of weird timing, but it's still possible Mixon gets cut as well. So there's like multiple sides here. There's a lot of uh upside i think to his role like you said and i you alluded to this but i haven't projected for even a lot larger role than you guys because i was like i mean if he's on this roster if this is the roster this is how i'd project it and it's a big role for him in a good season and he would be a value in the fifth round about where i think he's going now um at the same time i think the, think there's still risk that he could get completely cut like dalvin cook just did um or gets you know restructured I think the biggest risk that isn't talked about enough is if he stays and they still add another secondary piece, like they might be waiting for everything to to fall um, into place on all the markets for, um, you know, Dalvin and, and Zeke and Fournette and all of these, Kenyon Drake, whoever it is, I think they probably bring in someone who's a more substantial number two. And as you said, they were leaning into Pirine in certain situations over Mixon, really showing that they don't think Mixon is like, a must have piece to this offense that makes this offense run. And I think that's probably what would happen if they bring in another notable second running back where yeah. we could expect more of a split. Yeah. I think he's for the risk. I think he's priced about right, right now in the fifth round. Um, if they do enter the season with this backfield, I mean, he, he's going to creep up into the third round probably, um, mm -hmm. by, you know, you talk like end of August, whether that's right or not, I'm not sure, but like just on projectable volume going to get there. So he's, he's definitely tough to figure, you know, he had a ton of weeks where he disappointed relative to his workload. And then he had like the one monster week and, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a weird dynamic with Mixon who also just, you know, his numbers aren't great historically from, from a, a efficiency perspective, as far as the RB two, Right now, I have more Travion Williams and Chase Brown. That's mostly due to cost. Uh, the market just got crazy with rookies, like after the NFL draft, where like if you were a rookie, <laughs> people wanted to draft you. Like, and to me, like it's kind of 50 50 ish. Um, and maybe even Travion might have the lead as far as like more of that P. Ryan esque role. It's possible you want to avoid the situation completely if you think they add someone too. Cause I hate making these late round bets where it's like, you need something good to happen and then you need to be right. And like, we're already kind of there with, you have to be right between Brown and Travion. And then if we also have to, to dodge the, uh, the signing risk bullet, I'll, I'll probably just back off. Uh, I haven't been taking them either, but the upside is pretty clear. So I can understand why people are trying to make that swing. Yeah. Uh, going to wide receiver. We are really close in terms of projections here. And this is what happens with teams that have pretty established pecking order we've each got jamar chase around 165 targets t higgins around 125 targets tyler boyd around 80 targets spits out very similarly in terms of fantasy point production you know i mentioned baltimore maybe could be like that team that's like really concentrated in terms of not using ancillary guys and cincinnati is one of the teams that just does not use ancillary guys much you know we saw it when guys were banged up you know especially t higgins when he was like fake active a few times which was tilting but when these guys are healthy it's like th those are the three guys that are out there so chase i don't know if there's much to say about him i think he's the clear number two pick in drafts ahead of cmc and tyreek hill behind justin jefferson i think t higgins is going where he should at the two three turn don't have any strong opinions there i'm a little behind market on boyd but like uh, you know, if you're making some correlated bets, I certainly get um, using him. Yeah, I, I, I've always liked Boyd, but I, through the projection process, found myself thinking, like, he's definitely outside the wide receiver window. He's been, you know, his ADP is sort of right on that edge. 
and which means I probably won't be taking him much and be pivoting to like running back when I start to see him as the next highest receiver available. His targets per out run last year was down to 14.3%. That's pretty darn low. Higgins also fell from 22.4 the year prior to 19.4. The year prior, they were close in Chase's rookie season, Higgins and Chase. Um, but one little minor note on, on the Chase Higgins thing, Chase went from 21.2% as a rookie to 24.5, a lot more dominant, even on a per route basis. You mentioned Higgins is playing through injury a little bit. I still really like Higgins profile. We talked on the last shows about not really naming a number one Higgins in his own right, still solid targets per out run for a high a dot guy. That's very efficient as well. Still a bet. I think you can make, but I do think like, if you were going to name, you know, a number one or, you know, every case is a little bit different. Like Jamar Chase is a legit alpha and, and he showed that last year. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, Chase versus Jefferson is really the, the only unknown, I guess, as far that you could make and market as Jefferson first. I think that's right. Just because I think in terms of odds of getting like that 30% plus target share, it's Jefferson. Um, but you know, do you have it that way? I mean, it's kind of, well, I mean, I, yeah, for both that's of exactly these, right. but Okay. I want both of them. I do have Jefferson higher for that reason. Tight end. They've got Irv Smith and not a whole bunch else. And I just don't have that optimistic of a projection on Irv, even like assuming him as the guy, just kind of looking at the tight end utilization stuff, have him for 70 targets, almost 50 catches, just under 500 yards, a little over four touchdowns. You're pretty close. A little more. You have about 10 more targets, but it spits out pretty close. Um, it's a weird spot because you get a clear cut starter on a team that's going to throw a ton on a good offense, which is generally good for a tight end. But like, I'm still not super excited. It seems like his price has come down a little bit since people got happy. But um, thoughts on Irv Smith? Yeah, I mean, it just feels like him and Boyd are sort of like co number threes or three and four, probably would give Boyd the slight edge. I, I, I mean, I agree with you. I think he's like sort of interesting, but I'm not really that in on it. It's an interesting point back to the Jefferson Chase conversation that, yeah, Higgins is a really legit number two behind Chase, but I do think the Bengals have sort of a lack of depth here where, like, Boyd and Irv are kind of, like, not that great of a co-number three, number four weapon, and there's not really number five. You know, I mentioned Trenton Irwin earlier. I'm not adding him to any late stacks, but, like, that's your number five. Drew Sample is the other tight end that's going to play. Guy does not earn volume. He's a blocking tight end, like, literally at all. He had, like, two targets last year. I mean, but he's on the field. Some they're not going to throw to many other people. They're going to throw the backs a little bit, but I think Chase and Higgins have a you know a path to really consolidating between just those two, and they're yeah. both talented enough that like even though you think that you can sort of just double both of them, you kind of can't. You know they're they're just too good. And as far as how to play it in drafts, I, what I run into is Irv goes right around where <clears> some <throat> of the final running backs that I like go like before it becomes like real dart throws um even ones i don't necessarily like but like okay like you know devin singletary um roshan johnson tyler algier kendra miller i'm i'd rather kind of take that running back value than the pure dart throws late and then as we hit on the afc east podcast there's a lot of tight ends that with conklin dawson knox and stuff late that you know i'm fine making those bets instead of taking irv two rounds earlier yeah Cleveland, uh, we each have 64.7 plays per game. It's always funny when we get to the decimal, right? Ben is a little more aggressive on the pass rate at 60%. I have a 58.5% called pass rate for Cleveland. And, you know, got unknown situation a little bit with them entering the year with Watson as the starter. He was bad last year, but like not not that crazy that he was bad given that he hadn't played in like a year and a half or whatever. Um, Cleveland. Could yeah, his scramble good. rate was way down. His sack rate was up. I think that was something I noticed in the projection. It was just kind of one more sign for me. He probably wasn't comfortable yet playing NFL football. You know, he's like just getting hit too much in the, in the, in the pocket. Yeah. I feel like they want to run the ball efficiently. So I'm building in a little bit higher pass rate, but I'm afraid to go too high, but Thoughts on um, your 60% called pass rate here? Yeah, I think it's similar to Baltimore. We both have them coming up from the – last year they were at 55.5%. So you guys have them up three percentage points. I have them up four and a half. I Basically, they've always been a, a negative PROAE team and pretty, pretty consistently so. The talk has been they're going to be maybe a pass-heavy team playing a little faster. 
again, shout out Pat Foreman's great um, uh, piece on on pace over to establish the run. He dug into their trends a little bit um, after Watson took over the offseason hires, and he kind of agrees that's valid that it's looking like going to be a little bit more of a pass heavy team. I'm inclined to trust him, um, and so I shifted the PROE like back to neutral. I have their exp- I mentioned that earlier the expected pass rate. I have it at fifty nine point eight percent. I put them at sixty percent. I'm very slightly positive. You guys still have them. Um, a little bit to the negative, basically the exact opposite of what we talked about in the Baltimore one, where like you guys moved it forward, but just not quite as far as I did. Yeah. And you know, I think either way, Watson, the market is starting to get smarter. Watson, that's like, I refer to the market on these podcasts. It's tough because it's constantly evolving and changing, but um, to put some numbers on it, like Watson's one of my highest owned quarterbacks early on. He is going off at QB nine, he started, you know, the, the ADP's come up to like 84 now where like the gap between him and Lawrence is closing. It was really wide for a moment. And Watson was more like in the cluster with like Tua behind. And I do think he's kind of like the clear cut QB nine and probably a tier above, you know, when you start to get to Tua, I guess would be the next round. Even though I like Tua, I still prefer Watson. I'm um, taking the upside swing there. Um, thoughts on Watson specifically as far as like where you're drafting him. I'm having a hard time placing him. I think he's one of the QBs that because all of QB ADP is up, he still goes in a like he probably there's probably enough risk with him that he probably should fall a little bit more, which isn't to say that he should fall behind QB nine, but maybe I think I think that range of QBs is pulled up by the top six or seven going as high as they're going. Um, and so I would prefer not to be taking a QB, I guess, in that range and, and often find myself mm-hmm. not doing it. I definitely recognize the upside. The last time he played a full season in Houston, I think he led the NFL in yards per attempt on like a four and 12 team that wasn't, you know, particularly good. They knew they were going to throw there in all these past situations and he was still successful. He has that kind of upside, but also, as you mentioned, wasn't great last year. And I mean, it's not a guarantee that he's going to be that player again. You know, he's multiple years removed. There are concerns certainly, but as I noted, you know, finding little things like his scramble rate being way down last year, his sack rate being way up, that he just didn't have the same pocket feel last year is another one of those things where it's like, yeah, I mean, this guy hasn't played for a while. Definitely wasn't back to his full potential. I think last year they wanted to get him some reps, get some of the off-field stuff kind of off the front page and so he can focus more on football this offseason. Um, so, you know, I, I do think, you know, you know, you think about it from a human perspective, it might be easier for him to – realize his potential if you will this season um no not still a guy that feels gross to be drafting obviously for all the reasons of of off-field stuff but i i think you're right i think there's plenty of upside and he belongs right there in the qb uh hierarchy yeah and he's going earlier now so i'm not like as bullish on him and to, to add to the concerns like they're 13th in terms of like average implied team total definitely some teams ahead of them that you know have quarterbacks that are going behind him and the weather each year for Cleveland seems to like kill like one or two games, you know, previously Watson's played in a dome in protected conditions, which is going to help those efficiency statistics. Looking at running back, Nick Chubb was a value early on in the draft season, but people have wised up to that. He is one of those guys that doesn't have the prototypical like build that you love to target a running back in terms of the pass catching upside. Um, especially previously when they had Hunt, where it's like, well, he, you know, he doesn't dominate the carries and he's not going to get a ton of targets. It's a tough bet, but his efficiency historically, just year after year, kind of beats what you would expect out of a running back. And if you think they're better with Watson and now you don't have Kareem Hunt, you could see like that carry share tilts up and then that rushing efficiency is like bound to stay. He's in a, in a pocket for me. Where I actually feel like for a guy who doesn't catch a lot of passes he's pretty he's like a pretty safe safe bet yeah i mean a lot a lot of efficiency that we can bank on he's like such an incredibly consistently efficient runner some of the other really consistently efficient runners you find things like the system is is helping or they have a mobile quarterback or whatever like yeah i, I think cleveland has a good rushing system as well but like they don't they haven't really ever had a mobile quarterback necessarily uh, he's just like really good, Nick Chubb. I think. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm I'm with you. I, I do have a hard time. His price now being I, like right around the middle of the second and creeps into the front half of the second. Sometimes I have a little bit of a hard time with the lack of receiving upside. Yeah, 
but I mean, in half PPR and underdog, like that's a little bit mitigated as well. So it's tricky. Um, yeah, it's always like tricky what more, the real ceiling is. Yeah, late, late two, two, three turn when some of those other receivers go. Um, but yeah, when you start to compete with like, you know, Devonte Adams or, or whoever, that's when for me, I'm probably not going with Chubb just positionally. Um, even though I think he's he's extremely safe behind him. Where are you at on Jerome Ford? Yeah, I was gonna say behind him, a lot of Jerome Ford hype. We've got 100 carries. You got 77. We like Ford, but like like what's happened with him is kind of insane. Where he's like, he went from like to me like one of the best 16th to 18th round bets out there to like now he's going like round 14, and I'm like, I'll I'll just take somebody else, you know. Um, that I, I don't have a a lot more to say to that. Yeah, that's kind of like, how I'm it seems feeling. like he's a great handcuff that could have some standalone value. But, you know, I'm not taking him ahead of like Tyler Algier. I'm not taking him ahead of like Kendra Miller, some of these other guys that have a bit more of a, a solidified base role and then also still have, you know, contingent value upside. Yeah, I mean, like I – I don't deny the reading of the tea leaves, but this guy had eight carries last year in 13 games, no targets, didn't play a lot. And Kareem Hunt wasn't very good last year. Like, I do think they like him, but he was active for special teams, and they weren't playing him even with Hunt struggling. They just gave more work to Chubb. He's a tough one um, for for me as well. And, and the talk from some of the beat reporters in Cleveland that they might be bringing in, like, a lower-level – free agent running back is another spot again. Like it's tough with all these running backs that are available out there, but it's another spot that feels like a running back probably lands there. Right. Like who else do they have? They have Felton. Who's kind of like a running back wide receiver hybrid. They don't really have a lot of depth at running back anymore with hunt gone. So, I mean, this is one where if they bring in another back, I'm, a, I'm at least a little bit concerned about, you know, how clearly he's the number two as well. But I do, I mean, yeah. I've taken him. I've taken him. Like, I do see the upside, and I do see the the, the general bull case. Yeah, I just can't believe we're at the point where he's like a 13th, 14th rounder. Like, that is just it's too aggressive for me. Like, yep. Yeah. So, at wide receiver, we have Amari Cooper, Elijah Moore. We've each got Amari Cooper on 120 targets. Elijah Moore around 80 targets. Ben's a little bit higher than us on Elijah Moore. Um Donovan Peoples Jones, we have just over 70 targets. You know, if you average our, our two projections, really similar breakdown. And then Cedric Tillman as the wide receiver four, maybe has some big play upside and maybe maybe could could uh, uh compete with, with DPJ for that role. The Cooper stuff, but we were talking in our, our Discord a little bit. There's like a handful of players who like last year we were <clears throat> weary on because of like age and like kind of systemic concerns where it's like you know, these guys project well, but like they have these concerns and then they performed well. And now a year later, it's like, I don't know. It feels like we're, we're we've been like thrown the, the age systemic risk out the window because the player, you know, performed well last year, but they are a year older. Not that Amari Cooper is even that old. So maybe he's not the best example of this, but you know, yeah, we were some of the draft him last year in a, in a, and now he's going at the three, four turn, which is rich. Yep. Coming off a career year, <clears throat> some of the other guys we're talking about, to your point, you know, Keenan, Mike Evans, Nuke, uh, I think you mentioned Kelsey. Amari, a little bit, I think, younger than those guys. They don't have all their ages in front of me, but uh, maybe a little bit less risk in that regard. I do think there's just, like, general risk. I mean, last year was very productive early in the year when they didn't really have other options. If this is, like, a completely different offense, it's a little bit more spread. It might be more like his time in Dallas where he – I mean, especially later in his career, like he's always been really good, but didn't dominate volume as like a clear, like alpha number one. He's never really had like elite full season upside. Um, and then there's that small concern that he dropped from 8.5 targets per game with Brissett down to 6.5 targets per game with Watson. I don't think that's like a real thing. It's a pretty small sample. And again, still a career year. Always been an efficient player after the target, after Aaron's volume. I'm just a little bit like, questioning the upside at that price in terms of his ability to really consolidate targets and have like 140 target upside. We both have him about 120, as you said, an efficient player, 120 targets can go in that range in a, in a wide receiver frothy drafting environment. But like, I, I don't know that it's the, my favorite pick at that price when I 
don't really see like Keenan Allen, for example, I actually do see paths to him getting 140, 150 targets probably can't be as efficient as Amari, but I, I just, yeah, I, I, I have concern about his ability to hit a real volume ceiling. Yeah. And it's tough because you're weighing all these things and he's 29. He's just been in the league forever. So it feels like he's older than he is and kind of gets lumped in there sometimes, but I mean, you're, you're weighing it with like, oh, he had this great year last year and now they have Deshaun Watson, but like we still have some, you know, you know, you're assuming, especially if you're assuming they're like good with Watson this year, as opposed to, you know, his struggles last year, it's definitely tough. And then wide receivers in general are pushed way up. So it's like, well, you know, who do you take? Um, so it's, it's the difficult one. I don't really have a strong stance on Amari. I'm pretty like neutral, I guess, at the end of the day, as a result of all that. Elijah Moore is interesting you know, had the great rookie year for the Jets. And then year two, you know, they draft Garrett Wilson and they have quarterback troubles and they just have difficulty working Elijah in, in general. And it just went as bad as it could possibly go. He comes over to Cleveland. I think the upside case for Elijah is not a whole ton of target competition. And we still have, it was a prospect people liked who had a great year one. And you've got a really good quarterback. So, like, that's great. The downside case is, is he going to play, you know, in two wide receiver sets? You know, how much does that matter? Um, Is DPJ the number two? And, like, just – and we can't totally ignore what happened last year. So, another guy that's a bit of a mixed bag. Definite mixed bag. I think, you know, if you want a bull case, you, you take a longer view. You say he was really productive as a prospect and as a rookie. And so last year is easier to write off as like one kind of fluky year, tough situation, bad quarterback play, et cetera. We have, I, I think we, with young players, the, the general point is we, we focus too much on their NFL production, but we can look back and say we have three or four years of Elijah Moore being um, a productive receiver that can earn volume. His ADOTs in, in, in New York the last two years have been two, 12.4 and 12.6. I'm projecting that to fall quite a bit. Down to uh, my, In my projections, I have his ADOT at 9.2. I'm, I'm looking at more of like a you know more traditional slot role, which is like feels like a better for his size. I think he'll still have some vertical targets, but this is like kind of built off of the way Jarvis Landry was used in his two years under Kevin Stefanski. Uh, Stefanski. And I, I think with DPJ and Amari being a little bit more vertical receivers that – Elijah might play a little bit of a different role than the Jets, and it might be better suited to a skill set. So just sort of a minor note there. It, he's a tough one, like you said. I mean, it could go either way. Last year could be indicative of him not really having it. But uh, I think he's a bet that I'm willing to make and be like kind of even with the market on because he is in that range of the wide receiver window sort of starting to close. And he's one of those last few guys that I'm willing to say, yeah, I think he has some upside here. Yeah, I, I've struggled. Our ranks are pretty behind ADP on Elijah. It could change. You know, he's already <clears throat> generating like buzz in the off season, but you know, it's hard to parse through what's noise and whatnot. Definitely get the bet. And I think you know, I, as the off season progresses, it could be someone we flip on because like I'm nervous about being behind on him. But right now, I'm mostly just been drafting him on Watson teams. Uh, same for Cedric Tillman late and drafting him. We do like DPJ though. That's someone that I have a good bit of, uh, just think. And again, like I've Manny always been, all. I've always been weirdly down on him, but he kind of impressed me looking through his numbers. His target spot run fine, not great, but he's a high eight out guy. And he's always had the like yards per target efficiency. Um, and he's going to run routes. Like you said, this is not a really deep wide receiver room. He could be the one that keeps Elijah off the field in two receiver sets. He ran a career high in routes last year, had a pretty good year. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I got in excited about him doing the projections as well. Yeah, and his profile is one that, like, the three touchdowns he scored last year, like, that really should come up with that higher dot role, especially if Watson is returns to form even a little bit. So... Um, we have him even with like pretty low touchdown projections, but I, I could see some upside there where he could spike. So I've been taking a lot more of him than Elijah, just because in terms of ADP, Elijah's at 86 and DPJ's at 162. And it's, it's a big yeah. gap. Obviously you have the talent volume upside in Elijah's favor. Like if everything breaks right, it gives you kind of a league winning ceiling, uh, whereas DPJ probably doesn't have that, but he could be, you know, very useful for your your teams at his AD. Also, feels like a nice fit with Watson. You know, those extended plays, the Will Fuller deep shots. Feel DPJ's got that downfield, you know, profile. 
Yep. Let's go to tight end in Joku. You know, got that huge contract last year and now it seems like they're doing less of the, we're both projecting less of the tight end mix that they had done historically where they kind of mixed a lot of tight ends. We've got Njoku around 85 targets, but then Harrison Bryant around like 30. So like a really big gap there. And Njoku's always flashed in terms of his athleticism and his upside in that regard, getting him paired with Watson is a pretty good thing. Uh, it you know, seems like a solid option. It's just like systemically, sometimes the tight ends in that range look better on paper than than they turn out to be. Yeah, I mean, I think that's well put. I I totally see the case for him, and I uh, I've definitely taken him a couple of times. But it's a it's a like a you know a running running back target range for me, big time in drafts. So it's not a guy that I've taken a ton of. Yeah, same page. Let's go to Pittsburgh. Uh, another team that we had the same amount of plays, that 64.7 number. Again, I've got a 59% <laughs> called pass rate. Ben's got 60%. So pretty close. It, it works out where we're basically projecting the same amount of pass and rush attempts, which is 34 pass attempts per game, just over 28 rush attempts per game. I have found with these inputs um, that we're like way ahead of ADP on Kenny Pickett. Um with even like somewhat more conservative efficiency than I think you have. So do you like Pickett as a late round QB guy or what are your thoughts on him? I do. Um, I mean, the team has always played with pace. I think, you know, we're, we're regressing that some with this projection, honestly. Um, and, and I'm, I, I know I shifted their PROE to more neutral, um, which is a little more pass heavy than last year. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I'm like, I think like any shift in additional passing would offset any like potential pace regression with a young quarterback. And like, I think there's going to be play volume. I think there's going to be pass attempts in this offense. Pickett's like got knocked a little bit. I think from people looking at stuff like EPA and, and his actual results on plays, he had a really bad touchdown to interception ratio last year, had some bad luck on some TD stuff. I don't really think his really low pass TD rate is indicative of like how he'll be his whole career um you know missed a couple open guys i know uh pickens dropped the wide open td at one point deontay caught a ball that stepped on the line in the end zone and obviously deontay famously didn't catch a td all season and then on the interceptions uh one of the things i remember writing about in stealing signals his 2.5 percent turnover worthy play rate over a pff was tied fifth lowest of the 22 qualified qbs of whatever benchmark i used at pff for the qualification the only guys lower than him in turnover worthy play percentage were Burrow, Mah Mahomes, Hertz, and Herbert. And Pickett did have like nine interceptions still, but like a few of those, this is what I remember writing about, a few of those were like not even turnover worthy plays. They like bounced off receivers' hands and were picked off. So again, it's like one of those things where like, yeah, usually the the signals there and things like EPA, but in small samples with, with young players, sometimes we get some fluky stuff. We get some fluky interceptions. We get some fluky missed touchdowns. We get some elements where his profile, and I don't, I don't think Kenny Pickett's a superstar necessarily, but I do think this is an offense going to have volume. I think he probably played better than his numbers last year, and the market's probably too low on him. Yeah, and he's pretty easy to stack too because, well, if you like Pickett, you probably like Deontay a little bit. For, I know for us, we like Deontay a little bit, Fryermuth a little bit, not as into, into Pickens, which we'll talk about, but like pretty stackable. At running back, Najee, to me, he's like one of the, you know, the the RB prices have changed a lot, but Najee still strikes me as like the like a dead zone type running back. You know, running back that projects for a lot of volume. Who we're not sure if is good, and his team could be bad in terms of scoring too. Which like for the running back in particular is is not good. So you know, the bull case for Najee is the offense is better and he's healthier, and he's like the clear you know workhorse. Uh, I don't really see that happening. We have him for 232 carries. You have 252. We both have him for 49 targets and right around 200 full PPR points per game. So I don't know if I have, I, I might have like one Najee share. He's one of my lowest owned players right now. Conversely, Jalen Warren, one of my highest owned players, you know, we're definitely higher on his carry share um, than you are right now. We have 125 carries to to your 98 but part of that is like it's tough to parse like 
Warren's activity last year was that because of Najee's foot thing and him not being fully healthy? Are they really going to split a little bit? Um, but I do think there's just like paths to Najee failing and then Warren capitalizing on those paths. We talk about the fragility of, of running back projections a lot here. I'm with you on both of these. I actually have a bigger split between them, but I'm completely with you. I have not drafted Najee Harris yet at all. I've drafted a lot of Warren. Um, the, the hot sort of fire take I would have here is I think he has a very similar projection to Clyde Edwards Alaire entering 2022, entering year three of the rookie contract where the team has dealt with two years of inefficiency. Najee sub four yards per carry two years in a row. If he's playing that way again through year three and Warren is again, a more efficient backup. I think you have the, People did not think early last season there was any way CEH would get benched. He had six touchdowns early in the season, and he still got benched. The Chiefs are just like, we're done with this. Like, he's not actually – he's producing, and, and fantasy players are like, ah, he's scoring all these touchdowns. He's great for us. But he's not doing any more than what's available for him in our offense. I think there's some legitimate – I'm not saying this is definitely going to happen with Najee, but if he comes out and he's inefficient again this year – there is a breaking point. And I think year three of the rookie contract is sort of the leash that you get as a first round running back. It wouldn't surprise me if somewhere mid season, they start to move away from him a little bit. If he plays to the level he has the last two years, let's go to wide receivers where I know we still have, you know, a handful of target share going to like an unlisted wide receiver, just cause like not super confident on these guys, even though I don't know if they necessarily add someone, but you're going to see some target discrepancies as a result where Gretsch has 137 for Deontay. We have 124. Gretsch has 104 for Pickens. We have 89. And then we're kind of similar-ish on Allen Robinson. Uh, I, I think Deontay, like the touchdown stuff, I think is overblown. Um, I do think like he's, I don't know, he, he's been an enigma for years now, right? Like we talk about earning targets as a talent and that being really good for fantasy. I do think we have to account for that. Like you could be a target earner and like not that efficient with the target. And that's, that's not great either. Uh, when all said and done, I think he goes in general too late, you know, especially in this wide receiver heavy atmosphere that we have right now to be able to bank the amount of targets I think we'll see again um, is pretty valuable to me. And sort of like, you know, whatever happens happens, he's not going to be as inefficient as last year. Pickens, which, which I said last year, and he was still somehow inefficient, yeah. <laughs> more or less efficient. He had a career low white yards per target somehow, but he was like decently more expensive last year than he is right. this year. So like, no, I, I'm completely with you. He has a horrible yards per target relative to any other high volume wide receiver over multiple years, like you said. And so, but it is a thing where it's like, look, he's had 144, 169, 147 targets over the last three years, 140 plus three years running. That's an absurd amount of volume. To your point, at his price, I mean, if he's just league average in efficiency one season, he's a smash. Yeah, uh, I struggle with Pickens a little bit. You know, there were some disappointing metrics for him for his rookie season. So I definitely want to get your thoughts on him. But like I do, I think even with like the allure of the upside for Pickens, it's tough for me to see him like go ahead of Deontay. I think the market's finally corrected where Deontay is going ahead of Pickens. Um, they have, but for a while Pickens was going ahead of Deontay. I'm still like, I don't know, pretty, pretty lukewarm on Pickens. The runway is clear for him to run a ton of routes though. Uh, and I know coming out of college, he was someone that people had like, like there's a dude with a ton of upside, you know, if a couple of things had broke differently, he could have been drafted way, way earlier. Yeah. He's a guy where the, the targets per out run in year one were not particularly strong. However, with a high A dot and some efficiency on that, which he did have, you know, some after target efficiency, um, 9.5 yards per target uh, um, PFF numbers, I think, which is just really strong. I'm I'm still like in, a, in an A dot over 15. We're talking about like a really high A dot. So the the low targets per out run, like I also look at a thing called like that I've named weighted targets per out run, which you know incorporates air yards. His weighted targets per out run naturally looks a little bit more viable and again being efficient on all those air yards is helpful it wasn't a, like a perfect rookie year profile but i do think like you said he's gonna run a lot of routes not a ton of like with claypool gone not a ton of names the, the other guy we got to talk about is alan robinson i mean he's probably dust but he will get routes and this is something we've talked about with like aj green in the past or i know i've made this case where it's like 
almost a good thing that that's the other running guy running routes in the offense right. in terms of consolidating the volume for Pickens and Deontay. I mean, obviously he's also running routes against Deontay who, who earns a ton of volume. Um, but I do, I, I, I like, I'm with you. I think Deontay should go higher. I like both their prices though. I mean, I think they both go in a range, right? I want to get some exposure to both. I've capitulated a little bit. I shifted, um, one point of target share to Pickens from our unlisted wide receiver, got him closer to like that 16 to 17% range. Uh, yeah. Allen Robinson, you know, he's like you said, he's going to run routes, be the slot guy. It looks like, uh, and I've, maybe taking one or two of him in like round 17 or 18 on like a Seattle Pittsburgh stack. Like that's sort of, that's sort of it. I don't know if they, I don't think there's too much more to say here. Yeah. Uh, tight end prep fryer, Pat fryer Muth. You've got at 110 targets. We've got 99. Did mention like within Joku that like, you know, kind of like I see what, it, like what's to like on paper, but I don't love making that bet systemically. Friar I have a little bit more optimism. Um, and part of that's cost where he's, he's moved up a little bit, but I think just in terms of overall target potential, you know, he beats Njoku by quite a bit, which is a differentiator for me as far as like deciding between those two players, if I'm going to take a tight end at that point in the draft. Now, this is another reason I think to be in on Pickett, where like you, you have Pickens as this efficient vertical threat as a rookie. And another reason I didn't really directly say this, but shout out Blair Andrews at Rotovis has done great work showing rookie year efficiency tends to lead to more volume. So that's a positive for that bump you just made in Pickens target share. His rookie year efficiency should be helpful. Firemuth looks like a legit young tight end as well. He's got good weapons is the point I'm making on Pickett. Firemuth went from a 19.5% targets per out run as a rookie, which is a really strong number for a rookie tight end to 22.1% last year, which is like a legit in his prime top five tight end type number. Uh, yards per target also rose in addition to the targets per out run rising. His TD rate cratered last year. Everyone's did in this passing offense, but is still strong over a two-year sample. Because if you remember, Frymouth had like seven touchdowns as a rookie in kind of smaller volume. So now I think he has like, he only had two last year. So he has nine over two seasons. And, you know, obviously TD rate can fluctuate a lot, but it doesn't look like a guy who's going to not be able to score touchdowns. He's actually he came in and was billed as this big red zone weapon in his rookie year. That's why they were using him down there a lot. So, I mean, it looks like a, a tight end who can actually legit draw volume. I really like all three of the names actually in this passing game, Johnson, Pickens, and Fryermuth. I think it's going to be a pretty concentrated three-headed uh, passing attack. And, and the, again, that's a, another reason why like having Allen Robinson running the routes as the fourth and uh, as a guy who hasn't been a, a pretty viable NFL player the last few years, it's sort of nice and, and it yeah. concentrates the rest of the volume to the other three, at least in my head and in my projection. Um, it, this is a fun passing game to get pieces of, in my, my opinion. Yeah, like let A-Rob go out there, run a bunch of empty routes. That's that's perfect. We don't have to worry about you know some unforeseen talented player ascending. The only way this gets ruined is if like A-Rob's actually good and I'm, I'm right. highly, I think we're both highly skeptical of that. You know, it could happen, but we're skeptical about happen. happening. But you know, it's it's an undervalued passing game, I think, because the efficiency was so bad last year that the everyone's undervaluing all the pieces. Yep, agreed. Awesome. Uh, well, that was a fun one, the the AFC North, and this is episode three again of the off season's projections special with me and Gretch here on Establish the Edge. First two episodes are up: the AFC East and NFC East, and we'll continue to roll out episode every you know several days or once a week or so until we get through all eight divisions. Really appreciate everybody tuning in. Make sure you check out Gretch's work at Yards Per Gretch on Twitter, bengretch.substack.com as well to get access to the Stealing Signals newsletter. Find all my work over at Establish the Run. Appreciate everybody tuning in.